Good morning, everyone. It got very quiet. There were great conversations happening. My name is Mike Sfrega. I'm the director of the Global Risk and Resilience Program, and also I direct the Polar Institute here at the Wilson Center. So we want to thank you all for packing the house uh, on a 9 a.m. presentation day. We're here for several hours, and normally when somebody tells you that locks you in a room, uh, you may be a little uncomfortable with that. But from the enthusiasm I heard out in the hallway and the discussions here, I think we're going to be uh, doing quite well for the rest of the morning uh, and into early in the afternoon. Uh, Wilson Center is honored to host this discussion, implementing U.S. Global Water Strategy, a first year in review. Someone last evening asked me, what about this program tomorrow? And I searched for a moment and thought, the only response I had is, this is a big deal. And it's a big deal. And I think the rest of the morning we'll find out why it's such a big deal and why it's so important. So again, we are honored and we thank you for coming today and we're very honored to host this day. We want to give a special thank you to Ambassador Berniquet for coming, Ms. Bonnie Glick, President Turk, and uh, the Honorable Albaro Caseda. Thank you so much for spending the morning with us. Because we have such a packed day, I want to get right to the presentations and the programs. So our first speaker is Ambassador Marsha Berniquet. She is Deputy Principal, Assistant Secretary in the State of Department's Bureau of Oceans and International Environment and Scientific Affairs. She has served as U.S. Ambassador to Bangladesh and Senegal, among other posts. She has an extensive career in foreign service, receiving an honorary doctorate of public service from Lafayette College in 2018. Madam Ambassador, we welcome you to the podium. Good morning. And thank you, Mike, for the very kind introduction. Mike and I learned that we have common Brooklyn roots. It is a real pleasure for me to be here today to welcome all of you to a retrospective look at the first year of implementing the President's Global Water Strategy that can help inform our efforts going forward. I'm coming to you literally fresh off the plane from attending the UN Environmental Assembly meeting in Nairobi. Um, where water was a major focus. We are so pleased that EPA Administrator Wheeler, USA Deputy Administrator Glick, and many other U.S. government and non-government supporters of the water strategy are joining us here today. I also want to thank President Danilo Turk for being with us today. His leadership on water issues continues to have a lasting impact on international efforts to raise the profile of the global water security topic. And I would be greatly remiss if I did not mention the terrible tragedy that happened in southern Africa, um, what some are cause calling now the largest and most devastating what weather event to have occurred in that region. And so much of that tragedy involves water. Um, we are looking, as the U.S. government, to provide assistance Mozambique and Zimbabwe have already made disaster declarations. We wish the best for everyone who is surviving and recovering from that event. The Global Water Strategy was released on November 1st in 2017. It was the culmination of a year's work uh, of, by many of the people in this room to set the direction for the United States government's work on international water issues. We addressed three major challenges in that strategy. The first challenge is that there are many countries where a significant portion of the population still lacks access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Nearly two billion people worldwide lack access to water that is safe to drink, and nearly four billion lack access to safely manage sanitation services. This is not only a threat to human health, but a factor in migration, civil unrest, and terrorist recruitment. The second challenge is water insecurity. By 2030, more than half the world's population will still be living under water-stressed conditions. Many countries will not have enough water to meet domestic, industrial, and environmental water needs. These countries are fundamentally water insecure and risk increased fragility 
or failure. The third challenge the strategy addresses is the possibility of conflict over water. More than 270 water basins worldwide are shared by two or more countries. As water resources become scarce and variable, tensions over shared waters are likely to grow, increasing the potential for conflict at the local and regional level. As I mentioned, the strategy was developed over the course of a year by the Interagency Water Working Group. The group includes representatives from more than 20 U.S. government agencies and departments. Many of them are represented in the room here today among you. And I want to take this opportunity to recognize your extraordinary efforts in pulling the strategy together. The overarching goal of this strategy is to create a more water secure world. Simply put, a world where people have the water they need where they need it, when they need it, without living in fear of floods or droughts. The, water, the global water strategy has four strategic objectives that are aligned with the challenges I laid out. One, to promote sustainable access to safe drinking water and sanitation services and the adoption of key hygiene behaviors. Two, to encourage the sound management and protection of freshwater resources. Three, to reduce conflict by promoting cooperation on shared waters. And four, to strengthen water sector governance, finance, and institutions. To achieve these objectives, the United States is building capacity, investing in infrastructure, promoting science, technology, innovation, and information, mobilizing financial resources, engaging diplomatically, and strengthening partnerships, intergovernmental organizations, and the international community. So what does all of this mean? We have more than 20, as I said, US government agencies working on water in more than 60 countries. We have US experts working to strengthen and reform UN agencies and international financial institutions working on water. And we have US diplomats working quietly behind the scenes to support riparian government efforts to cooperate over water. This is what we are excited to present to you today. And I am so pleased that we again are are, will be joined here this morning by the EPA Administrator, Andrew Wheeler, and USAID's Deputy Administrator, Bonnie Glick. EPA is at the forefront of safeguarding US waters and has been a critical part of our efforts to strengthen the international community's efforts on drinking water, wastewater treatment, and protecting water quality. USAID has been the United States' leader in sector reform and in building the capacity and creating the environment to successfully move countries towards a more water secure and self-reliant future, an effort I saw most recently firsthand in Bangladesh, where the challenges are many. You will hear from them, and then you will hear from other experts who have been working over the past year to implement the President's Global Water Strategy. We also encourage you to read more about what U.S. government agencies have accomplished under the Global Water Strategy by looking at the new Global Water Strategy web platform, which can be found on USAID's Global Waters website and on the Department, State Department's water webpage. There are handouts announcing this new web platform available um, just outside the room. Through all of this, there is one message that will be self-evident, but bears repeating. We could not do this without the support of all of you. This is not a problem that the United States will solve alone. It is through partnerships where we can leverage our respective strengths, where we will be most successful. And that's the message for today. These are hard problems, but they are problems that matter and so they are problems worth tackling head on. And I'm convinced that by working together, 
we can achieve a more water secure future. Again, thank you very much. I wish um, you all a productive and informed day. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Our next speaker uh, is Ms. Bonnie Glick. She's a Deputy Administrator at USAID. Ms. Glick began her career as a Foreign Service Officer at the State Department, has worked in both nonprofit and corporate worlds in multiple capacities. And prior to her current position, she served as Deputy Secretary of the Maryland State Department of Aging. Would you please welcome to the podium our Deputy Bonnie Glick. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. And good morning to all of you. It really is a pleasure to be here today to talk with all of you in celebration of the lead up to World Water Day. And I'm honored to share the podium with Ambassador Bernicat and with EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler, with whom I share a passion for ensuring the delivery and availability of clean and safe water worldwide, and a vision for the development and infrastructure that's needed to attain ambitious goals in order to get there. Thank you, too, to the Wilson Center for hosting this great event, the ability to bring together this exceptional group of participants is a testament to your convening influence and the value we all see in events like today's, where we can share experiences and learn from each other's best practices, as well as, to be frank, sometimes learn from each other's mistakes. Five years ago, Congress passed visionary legislation to make clean water and sanitation a priority across America and around the world. One year ago, the global water strategy that resulted set a baseline for measuring the results of our efforts to make that a reality. Today, we stop for a moment to mark the progress we've made by gathering together to celebrate and to reflect and to share some of the successes that illustrate the many ways that the global water strategy is supporting innovative collaboration across the US government. For anybody here who's new to the clean water business, the 2014 Senator Paul Simon Water for the World Act, he was my senator a long time ago from the great state of Illinois, the Senator Paul Simon Water for the World Act called for the creation of a whole of government global water strategy. And on the development front, USAID in the form of foreign assistance and technical assistance in the field drives a lot of those efforts. But it's so much bigger than that because our role in government is really that of an enabler of interagency work, work across the entirety of the federal government. And so today, we're able to showcase specific plans for no fewer than 20 agencies and departments working collaboratively from their various perspectives, some with funding from USAID and some with funding from their own budgets. The stories provide a flavor for the discussion likely to be highlighted by U.S. government speakers and in other conversations today. I'm reminded of a trip I took a few years ago with a group of Pakistani teenaged boys. We were in upstate New York and it was a gray, overcast, drizzly, and hazy day. And one of the boys from Baluchistan walked outside, turned to me, and said, what a beautiful day. I was a little surprised because we here don't tend to think about a gray, cold, wet day as anything other than kind of a raw feeling day. But one's opinions are certainly shaped by one's experiences and where one lives. A young man in Baluchistan values any rain, 
any rainy day because it's a direct link to the land, to agriculture, to food production, and we all know teenage boys think a lot about food. Well, that helped to shape my perspective as well. I now look at gray, overcast skies differently. They're now bright days to me because they bring water. In USAID, we have a singular mission around the world to help countries on their journeys to self-reliance. Ultimately, our goal is to end the need for foreign assistance, to put ourselves out of business. One of the major areas in which we see challenges around the world is in issues associated with water, the lack of it, the overabundance of it, the governance around it, the filtration of it, and the distribution of it. Among our focus areas as it relates to all of these challenges is providing developing countries with technical assistance and training to enable them to address many of the issues on their own. We draw on decades of experience around the world helping countries become self-reliant with access to clean drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene programs, and we collaborate and share best practices as they are developed, learned, and trained from country to country. We count ourselves blessed many times over when we see people we have trained in one country go on to train people in other countries in their region. As we're sitting here today, we in USAID have just dispatched a team of experts to Mozambique to address the terrible flooding they have had in the last few days and weeks. The damage assessment will surely reflect the need for massive rebuilding of homes, roads, and infrastructure, but it will also reflect the likely spread of waterborne diseases as we will collaborate with local officials as well as with colleagues in many parts of the U.S. government and in regional governments to address some of these issues. Some of the other examples of the whole of government approach to the global water strategy include work that's being done by the Centers for Disease Control in supporting in support in the form of an innovative approach to managing human waste with solar power in Kenya, or the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and their provision of technical help in Thailand's efforts to design controls for urban flooding and improve resilience in the face of uncertain climate futures. We're even partnering with NASA to gather data on river levels and potential flooding and to provide scientists on the ground in 30 countries with the training to plan for food security and to prepare for disasters. They can monitor the effects of glacial runoff and they help provide real-time monitoring data to guide emergency response efforts after last year's massive dam rupture in Laos. There are a lot of exciting things going on. Water is so fundamental to life that if your population doesn't have sustainable access to a good and clean supply, there's only so much else that you can do developmentally. But once you have that regular, sustainable access to clean water, there's almost no limit to where you can go. Unfortunately, more than two billion people in the world today still lack access to safely managed drinking water, and twice that many do not have properly managed sanitation. The related issues of water stress, either too little or too much, also affects more than two billion people, and it's projected to rise, particularly among some of the world's most vulnerable populations. On the plus side, the number of countries that are transitioning from immediate relief to longer-term development is also on the rise. It's the very embodiment of progress along the journey to self-reliance. As we all move into the second year from the 2018 benchmark, we must maintain and strengthen our resolve that our work will be results-oriented, effective, and sustainable. 
because U.S. government resources alone cannot begin to address the world's water and sanitation challenges. This means we must work with as many partners as possible to mobilize public and private financing to fully implement water and sanitation strategies, policies, and monitoring systems toward the goal of universal access. This is something that we predict will be on the order of $114 billion. It also means casting as wide a net as possible, gathering wisdom and insight anywhere it is found. India, for example, is a real leader in harnessing its people's natural entrepreneurial spirit to find concrete solutions. The USAID administrator, Mark Green, went to Hyderabad not long ago to celebrate the opening of 50 portable kiosks around the city to provide 150,000 people with potable water, the product of collaboration between the Safe Water Network, the Greater Hyderabad Municipal Corporation, and Honeywell Corporation. Israel can surely teach us about reclamation. When I traveled to Israel with Maryland's governor, Larry Hogan, we learned that Israel, a country in the desert, manages to reuse or recycle an astonishing 85% of their water, which is orders of magnitude beyond any other country. This desert nation has made the desert bloom and they have generously shared their expertise with water-stressed countries all over the world, including with water-stressed states here in the United States. And in Ethiopia, where I once served as a foreign service officer, government officials and students at Addis Ababa University are using geospatial data provided by the US Geological Survey to not only identify and map groundwater resources, but to train other Ethiopians and Africans to expand this mapping capacity in other areas. The Ethiopian government has really leaned in, setting ambitious goals for both supply and sanitation, and with USAID support, exploring market-based solutions and capacity development at all levels because they recognize that doing so is the key to sustainability. Like I said, there are a lot of exciting things going on. I encourage everyone to check out all the stories from across the US government at globalwater.org. But meanwhile, please enjoy today's event. Keep learning from one another. Keep up this very important and very good work. Thank you all so much for having me here today. And cheers. Thank you so much. It's now an honor and a privilege to introduce our next speaker. As of about three weeks ago, Mr. Andrew Wheeler became the 15th administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He was previously, previously confirmed by the U.S. Senate as a deputy administrator of EPA in April of 2018 and became acting administrator in July of 2018. Administrator Wheeler has dedicated his career to advancing sound environmental policies. His first position following law school was actually at the EPA as a career employee. He served as a special assistant in the Pollution Prevention and Toxics Office where he received three bronze medals. After his time at EPA, Administrator Wheeler moved to Congress, where he eventually became the Majority Staff Director and Chief Counsel of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. Throughout his career, he has received bipartisan support and recognition for his work and leadership. Along with his other accomplishments, Administrator Wheeler is an Eagle Scout. And as a former mountaineer, I can tell you that Administrator Wheeler has also summited Mount Kilimanjaro. I realize it may not compare to the other accomplishments in his career, but I took particular note of that. <laughs> I will also say that it is an honor to have him here today because the Wilson Center this year has celebrated its 50th anniversary from when Congress created this institution. 
to be a bipartisan institution to hold discussions like we are having today. So as a nation's think tank, we are very pleased to invite now to the podium Administrator Andrew Wheeler. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. And I guess you're celebrating your 50th anniversary this year. We're celebrating our 49th anniversary. So we will be 50 years old next year. You're just a little older than us. Um, good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you today for this important event. And the timing couldn't be better with World Water Day on Friday. It's a privilege to be here with so many distinguished speakers and guests. And thank you all for joining us. And I want to thank the Wilson Center for hosting. I also want to recognize our colleagues at the State Department, USAID, and the U.S. Water Partnership for all the hard work that went into today's event. As the administrator of the U.S. EPA, I believe that water issues are the largest and most immediate environmental and public health issue affecting the world right now. By water issues, I mean primarily clean and safe drinking water, marine litter, and water infrastructure. Right now, up to 2.5 billion people around the world lack access to safe drinking water and, as a result, proper sanitation. This fact leads to anywhere from 1 to 3 million deaths per year. And those most likely to die from a lack of safe drinking water are young children. According to the United Nations, nearly 1,000 children die every day due to preventable water and sanitation-related diseases. On the marine litter issue, billions of pounds of waste enter our oceans each year, harming marine life and coastal economies. On infrastructure, we estimate that more than $700 billion are needed to modernize the United States water infrastructure over the next 20 years, not to mention the rest of the world. Much of the world faces similar or worse infrastructure challenges. I am here today because I believe and President Trump believes that we must do more to address these issues. There will be some who will say that this all stems from climate change, but the truth is that the water challenges have been around for generations and are causing immediate deaths annually. Areas of the world have struggled with water availability for centuries, and these struggles are due to access, geography, infrastructure, and technology, or lack thereof. My frustration with the current dialogue around environmental issues is that water issues often take a back seat. It's time to change that. We need to do something about the millions of people who die each year due to a lack of clean water and sanitation. We need to do something about marine debris. And I believe we can do this while still addressing other challenges that loom on the horizon. As we speak, there are pilot projects around the world focused on water issues. But we need to get past small pilot projects to solving the problem for everyone. We need to leverage our lessons learned, step up public and private investments, and provide more effective financing and technical assistance abroad. That is what I hope to initiate here today and then work together to accomplish in the months and years ahead. Between the federal departments, NGOs, corporations, and international institutions represented here today, we had the resources, the technology and expertise that many nations so desperately need. But we need to raise a public awareness and unite our efforts in a manner that is effective and will stand the test of time. In November of 2017, the U.S. published its first ever U.S. Global Water Strategy for this very reason. The strategy lays out the U.S. government's four key objectives. One, access to clean and safe drinking water and sanitation services. Two, sound management and protection of fresh water resources. Three, cooperation on shared waterways. And four, strengthening water sector governance and financing. Of course, much of this work is a continuation of what we are already doing. The U.S. remains one of the world's largest donors in the water sector, investing in infrastructure, technology, private sector engagement, and innovative financial instruments to mobilize local capital. We will focus we will continue to focus our efforts on countries and regions where needs and opportunities are greatest and where U.S. engagement can best protect our national security interests. The difference is 
that we are elevating this work to address global water security to a new level under President Trump. I will explain how within three areas of immediate concern, drinking water, marine debris, and water infrastructure. First, drinking water. The foundation of water security is access to clean, reliable drinking water sources. Here in the U.S., we have made tremendous progress on this front. In the 1970s, more than 40 percent of our nation's drinking water systems failed to meet even the most basic health standards. Today, over 92 percent of community water systems meet all health-based standards all of the time. There are a variety of reasons for these gains, and I'll mention two that are particularly relevant in today's discussion. First, forward-thinking lawmakers and private businesses understood that investments in America's water infrastructure would pay dividends for decades to come. Second, our laws and regulations protect our water resources while recognizing the vital role of states and the private sector. Our federalist system is one of our strengths. Those closest to the situation are often best suited to address it, while Wa Washington is often better suited to conduct the research, establish the standards, monitor progress, and intervene when the situation warrants. This approach has served us well, and we continue to see progress. For example, EPA provides targeted grants and technical assistance to the U.S. territories of American Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. We work with our federal counterparts, utilities, and the governors to monitor drinking water and oversee waste management. Our multifaceted, multilayered approach is working. Between 2003 and 2017, the percentage of people in the U.S. Pacific Islands receiving safe water increased from 39 percent to 82 percent. Health-based violations that were common 15 years ago have become a rarity. We are committing, committed to sharing this type of progress with developing nations throughout the world. For example, EPA and USAID joined forces to develop the Drinking Water Laboratory Capacity Building Program in West Africa. This program helps provide clean drinking water in urban areas by building the capacity of labs for sampling, analysis, and quality assurance. EPA provides the technical assistance and know-how, while USAID provides the funding and on-the-ground presence. The project launched in, in Ghana and sparked a new focus of water quality across the country, including the development of a quality assurance manual, which will improve water quality for 500,000 consumers. This manual is now being used as a model for other labs in the region, and labs in Ghana have already used this knowledge to mentor labs in Nigeria. We are excited about the progress of this program and believe it holds potential for other areas around the world. Here in the U.S., we are blessed with an abundance of waterways scattered across our landscape. However, in parts of the American West, we still face water shortages. These problems are typical in many other arid climates around the world. And as populations and industries expand, this problem is reaching more communities. Droughts also pose a serious threat. We are working to get ahead of these issues and provide water security for generations to come. Just last month, we announced that EPA will lead the development of a National Water Reuse Action Plan. From recycling treated wastewater to finding new applications for water produced from oil and gas extraction, there is innovative work happening across the water sector. We want to accelerate that work through coordinated federal leadership. Our Water Reuse Action Plan is the first initiative of this magnitude that is coordinated across the water sector. The next dimension of our water challenges is protecting our oceans, bays, rivers, and watersheds. That brings me to the issue of marine litter, which has become a topic of global concern. Before we dive into the specifics, we must provide some important context. Every year, an estimated 11 to 28 billion pounds of waste ends up in the ocean, and nearly 60 percent of it comes from six Asian countries. Most of the trash that ends up in the ocean originates on land. Approximately 80 percent of ocean trash comes from land-based sources, including plastics. To be more effective, we must address the problem before it gets to our oceans. This means improving waste management and recycling. The U.S. is taking a leadership role in these areas. 
At EPA, we held our first ever recycling summit this past November. The summit brought together leaders from all levels of the recycling value chain to discuss ways we can strengthen the recycling industry and markets. We will reconvene the summit this year and address our progress. I'm also proud to report that EPA and the U.S. Trade Representative led the U.S. negotiating team from the environmental chapter of the USMCA, the new NAFTA, which contains the most comprehensive set of enforceable environmental obligations of any trade agreement to date, including first-time provisions to address marine litter and debris. One of EPA's key programs in this space is our Trash-Free Waters Program. We work directly with states and municipalities and businesses to reduce litter, prevent trash from entering waterways, and capture trash that is already in our waters. For example, we are directing, directly supporting the installation of trash traps in the Mobile Bay Estuary. We also track and measure the effectiveness of other trash mitigation techniques and compile them in a compendium of great practices. One of the most cost-effective solutions is a litter trap installed on a tributary to the Anacostia River not far from here. One of the most innovative examples is the world's first ever solar-powered trash water wheel, which was created and installed in Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Between May of 2014 and June of 2015, the water wheel collected 278 tons of trash. We've taken what we've learned through the Trash-Free Waters Program and expanded it to communities in Central America, the Caribbean, and South America. In Panama, we helped stakeholders install the country's first ever trash boom to control the flow of trash in a highly polluted Panama City River before it reaches the ocean. In Jamaica, we joined stakeholders together with the Peace Corps Jamaica and the Sandals Foundation to improve solid waste management practices. As a result, we helped the Sandals Foundation establish a program for better waste collection and separation. Similarly, we helped the government of Peru expand the number of communities that collect and separate recycled materials. We also assisted local governments in identifying and removing waste hotspots in and around the waterways. Looking ahead, we will focus our expandi on expanding these efforts with our European and Japanese counterparts to the six Asian countries that contribute nearly 60% of the world's marine waste. This summer, we are slated to finalize a new partnership with the State Department to help Sri Lanka improve its waste management. EPA will provide technical assistance to develop a comprehensive solid waste management program that will prevent land-based sources of trash from reaching the ocean. When I travel to the G7 in France and the G20 in Japan later this spring, I will make marine litter a top priority. Let's move on to the third and final area, water infrastructure. The unfortunate reality is that many projects around the world never get off the ground due to a lack of funding, not a lack of ambition or necessity. Due to budget realities and the scale of our challenges, we've had to develop creative ways to finance these projects and modernize our nation's water infrastructure. My agency oversees the implementation of the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act also known as WIFIA, which established a federal credit program to accelerate investments in water infrastructure. This program is, is just two years old. We're, we're starting the third year of grants in the next couple of weeks. We provide borrowers long-term, low-cost supplemental loans, which are not readily available in capital markets. To date, we have issued seven loans through the WIFIA program, totaling over $1.8 billion dollars. Combined, these projects will help finance over $3.8 billion in infrastructure investments while creating over 6,000 jobs. And that's just the beginning. This past year, the second year of the program, we invited an additional 39 projects across the nation to apply for the WIFIA loans that would help finance over $10 billion in water infrastructure and create up to 183,000 jobs. WIFIA could be the ideal model for other nations or international institutions like the UN or the World Bank to use to advance major water projects. There are also examples of innovative financing for environmental projects in the private sector, such as the circulated capital. Nine large companies, including Procter & Gamble, PepsiCo, 3M, and Coca-Cola, have committed between 5 and $10 million each to provide no and low-interest loans 
to cities and companies to build and scale recycling infrastructure and sustainable manufacturing technologies. They also launched an initiative to prevent marine litter and they aim to raise $150 million to fund waste infrastructure solutions in Southeast Asia. We are ready and willing to assist, assist these efforts. Across the government and across the globe, there is a tremendous amount of work being done. My hope today is to draw more attention to it and to bolster it. But my ultimate goal is to see us move from a patchwork of pilot projects to comprehensive solutions. This will take time, but it can be done. The U.S. is living and breathing proof. In less than a century, we transformed our rivers, bays, and oceans from dumping grounds to meccas of tourism and economic activity. And today, the science and systems behind our drinking water can and should serve as a model for other countries. Millions around the world are suffering from a lack of clean water. I believe, as does President Trump, that they deserve our immediate attention. It is our hope that we can elevate these issues to global priority and generate the urgency and unity needed to address them. Thank you for your time and thank you for your attention, and I look forward to working with all of you as we advance the global water security. Thank you very much. Well, it would be hard to put together uh, a, a foundation for a discussion uh, any better than what we've had this morning. So Ambassador Brennickett, thank you so much. Deputy Administrator Glick, thank you. And Administrator uh, Wheeler, thank you so much for setting the right tone and tenure, but also for providing for us, I think, a valuable foundation for the rest of the, the discussions this afternoon, uh, this morning and, and into the afternoon. So with that, I'm going to call a very traditional audible. Uh, as Wilson always does, we have a little bit of time. So what I will recommend is that we take 10 minutes, we stretch our legs, uh, and we come back here for 10 o'clock start for our panel discussion. Does that sound agreeable? I see a lot of head nodding. Okay, that is the plan. 10, 10 a.m. would start promptly. Thank you so much. <laughs>